Evening, folks. Evening. Well, no matter of church, good to see y'all tonight. Appreciate you being here. Isn't it nice evening under here? Praise the Lord. I'll tell you what. Give me camp meeting time. Yeah. Isn't that feel? Boy, I tell you what, you come up here early in the morning and the fog is settling over this. And they just, you just know it's that time of year. Looking forward to it. Amen. Amen. So I want to encourage you to, uh, to be faithful to those meetings. To be in prayer for those meetings, uh, be in prayer for our evangelists, and uh, invite people to come. You know, uh, a lot of people don't don't realize that you know services like that are going on right now. So you need to need to put it out there and let them know that there's, there's flyers back there that you can take and put up around in different places and uh, let people know that we're going to have our uh, our camp meeting again this year. Speaking of which, we got a camp meeting T-shirt. Look at here. Don't that look good? Yeah. Little anchor on the front says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth light unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us that bread. Amen. So if you'd like to have one of those, let me know. We got them up there in the in the church in the office. You can uh, you can get one of those. So I'm gonna have to get with Donna and see how much they are. How much are they, Donna? How much? Eight dollars. Eight dollars. Got a good heart to give us ten. Amen. How's that? <laughs> Amen. 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 So we got assorted sizes up there. Let us know if we don't have any size, maybe we can get it. Uh, get ready to go to Lord in prayer tonight. Uh, remember Cliff Lamb. I got word this evening. Looks like he may have to have back surgery, and uh, so y'all keep him in prayer. Uh, we got others that are uh, got surgeries coming up. Margot's uh, September seventeenth. Jane Strider's got hers on the tenth of September. Mr. Carter's got. Knee surgery on the 26th, so y'all remember those. And if you will remember our uh, children and parents with Lumpy Grove, uh, with all this stuff going on with the school, and then we've got we've got some children whose parents are uh, going to court over child custody and everything. It's just I, I tell you what, those children they have nothing to deal with without having to deal with that too. And, and so just uh, just remember Aldry and, and our <coughs> folks that work there uh, with the kids. And then just uh, remember the children as well. Uh, remember our ladies that are expecting. Remember Whitney and uh, Jordan. Uh, those are those that got babies on the way, so y'all remember them in prayer. Others we need to remember tonight? Any others? Louise?
all those that are suffering in body, we ask that you minister to them tonight. We've got those that are recovering from surgeries, those that are facing surgeries. God, we, we're thankful tonight that you know every need that is represented here tonight, whether it's loved ones that are sick, loved ones that are lost, loved ones that are going through trials. Father, you, uh, you know every individual here tonight, every need that's represented. And so, Father, we just cast all of our cares upon you right now. God, we're so thankful that you're you're so, you're large, you're big enough tonight to handle it all. And God, we just uh, we rejoice in that, and we, we find comfort and peace in that. And we just want to give you praise. Now, Father, we pray tonight for our nation. We ask God that you have your hand upon this nation for the upcoming election. Uh, God, this is a very critical time in, in our nation, and uh, Father, we pray for all the unrest and all the division and the chaos. And we just ask God that you would work there and prove that. And uh, that souls will be saved because of it, lives will be changed. And, and Father, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. So, Father, have your way in this service tonight, minister to those needs, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you washed in blood tonight? Amen. Let's stand and sing. Amen.
Okay. He was brother Mike had back surgery today, very lengthy surgery, and he's uh, they didn't do everything they needed to do, uh, but uh, they did what they could do safely, and he's in ICU now, recovering from surgery. So y'all keep Mike in prayer if you will. Anything else need to be announced tonight? Any other prayer requests? All right. There's uh, there's some study sheets back there on the table if you didn't get one on the way in. Uh, we're back to the Bible study on prophecy tonight, so go ahead and open your Bibles up to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And then when you get there, 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. You may when you're there. Good. 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 How's everybody in the parking lot? Y'all good? Good. Alright, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We're not going, that's the only verse we're going to read tonight. You should be getting very familiar with that verse of Scripture. We've read it several times now. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Father, we ask once again that you'll speak to our hearts tonight. We are thankful, Lord, for your word. Uh, God, uh, for the fact that it is so true and, and steadfast and unchangeable. And Father, we are thankful for the sure word of prophecy that we have from the word of God. That we, uh, we don't walk in this world in darkness as your children. That through the word of God we can, uh, we can see uh, and understand what is going on around us. Uh, we, will, we can tell where we're at uh, as far as your uh, word goes, as far as your will, and, and as far as your, your, uh, your plan, your purpose. So God, we're thankful for that tonight. So Lord, just continue to speak to our hearts, grow us, uh, mature us, and we'll thank you for all that you do. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, Last week, or not last week, but the last time that we were together in uh, this Bible study, we began to look at uh, the cultural sign of persecution. And we've been, we've been looking at these signs, and, and when we're talking about signs, and I, we're not supposed to go around looking uh, for signs and asking God to give us a sign. Uh, that's not the, the purpose of this thing. But Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, uh, lift up your head, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. So uh, those things that come to pass are really the things that we've been talking about uh, when we're talking about signs. We started out looking at uh, when we uh, looking at international signs and looking at uh, different nations, Israel, America, uh, Russia, and those type of uh, things, and, and what's going on in those nations that uh, would cause us to say, hey, you know what? The coming of the Lord is, is drawing nigh. Amen? And then we, we kind of switched gear, gears and we started looking at the cultural signs, things that are going on in our culture that uh, help us to understand that we are in the, the season of the Lord's return. Amen? Amen. And uh, we, we, we looked at persecution. We started that two weeks ago on this first part of the cultural sign of persecution. And one of the things that we talked about is that not all persecution is violent. Amen? But we do know that throughout the world, Christians, people that are walking by faith, are being persecuted in very violent ways. We know people are being killed. We know people are being tortured. We know people are being uh, imprisoned without cause uh, because of their faith. Amen? But in the United States and America, we face a different type of persecution. And some of the things that we talked about were uh, being stereotyped. Amen? Uh, being threatened. We talked about uh, a form of uh, persecution in our culture today against Christians is litigation. That they want to take you to court over things. And they, because you're not tolerant or accepting of certain things that go against the Word of God, they want to bring lawsuits against you. And so that's the kind of persecution we're seeing as Christians today. And I, I want you to know, though, that as time goes on, as the Lord tarries His coming, that this, this is just the beginning, folks. And, and I, I really believe that the persecution uh, that we're seeing today is going to intensify. And that it's, it probably will become violent. I mean, look at our world today. Look at our culture. Look at what's going on in our nation today. And the violence that we're seeing. Amen? Amen. And it wouldn't 
wouldn't take much for that violence to turn against uh, Christians and, and, and those who believe in God and trust in the Lord and those kind of things. And so I really believe that the Lord tarries is coming, that the, the persecution is going to move away from the stereotype and the threats to actual violence against Christians. Amen? And it already has some, uh, but I think that, that that's going to increase. And so tonight we'll, uh, we're going to pick up the, the persecution, uh, the cultural sign of persecution, and we're going to begin by looking at persecution of Christians in the Bible. Persecution is not something new. Amen? It's been going on throughout history. Uh, against people of faith. And so uh, when we're looking at the persecution in the Bible, it didn't start in the New Testament. The, the, the people of faith uh, were persecuted in the Old Testament. We know that the prophets were persecuted. Amen? They went out preaching the Word of God. They went out preaching what thus saith the Lord. And they were persecuted. Jesus even told the religious leaders, He said, listen, you persecuted the prophets. You killed the prophets. Your fathers killed the prophets. And now you build these fancy shrines and tombs uh, for them. And things like that. And it was your ancestors that killed them. And, and so we know that there was persecution there. You get over in Hebrews chapter 11 and you read about the, those that were persecuted because of their faith. They, they were stoned, they, were, they went hungry, they lived in caves, and, and all of those kind of things because of persecution. So it didn't just start in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, we begin to see the persecution directed at Christ and His followers. Right. And so that's, that's what we kind of look at here uh, in the first part of this study tonight. Matthew chapter 2, we're not going to read all of these passages of Scripture, but in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, that's usually a, a passage of Scripture that we read at Christmas time. Amen? And uh, we read it, uh, we, we get these three wise men and, and all that going on, and, and if we're not careful, old Hallmark will mess us up doctrinally. Yeah. Amen? They'll send these Christmas cards out, and they'll show the manger and the three wise men on the, on the camels and that kind of stuff. Hallmark, I'm telling you right now, they're going south. They're going south. Somebody called me up this week and said, well, I, oh, is Jason Music telling me this? Jason Music said I guess you're going to have to put a pinch gun to quit watching one. Hallmark said they had a same-sex marriage on there the other day. On Hallmark. That's right. Hey Amen. It's just going to be golf. Amen. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, this is what that section of Scripture there out of Matthew chapter 2 is where we see Herod uh, he murdered all the children in Bethlehem from two years old and under. Well, that's the direct result and direct result of the birth of Christ. Amen. The wise men came into Jerusalem. They wanted to know where the, the king was born. And he, he Herod didn't know. And, and so uh, they found out that it was in Bethlehem. And so uh, by the grace of God, the wise men didn't return back through Jerusalem and tell Herod they went another way because they were warned of, of God. And uh, Herod didn't, didn't take too kindly to that, so he decided that if that's where that baby was born, and if it was two years ago, then he was going to murder all the two-year-old and under children in, in Bethlehem. Amen? Wow. And so that's a direct, uh, that's persecution against Christ. Right. Amen? And, and the families and the children of Bethlehem suffered because of that. In Mark chapter 6, verses 29, 25 through 29, that's where John the Baptist is beheaded. And he, he wasn't beheaded because he stole somebody's sheep. He wasn't beheaded because he, he lied about something. He was beheaded because he preached the truth. He was beheaded because he confronted Herod Antipas about this marriage to his brother's wife and all of this. And they didn't take too kindly to that. And, and so they had him beheaded. Amen. And so that's, a, again, a form of persecution. Let me tell you something about evil men. When they, when they are confronted with the truth instead of repentance, they just want to try to eliminate the light. They want to try to eliminate the truth. Amen. Amen? And that was the case there with John the Baptist. Well, let me tell you something. In this day that we're living, people don't want the truth. They want to believe a lie. They want to believe in a fairy tale. They, they want to think that everything is wonderful and great and, and you know, you got to let people do whatever they want to do and that's, that's the way that it ought to be and things like that. Folks, I'm going to tell you something right now. You go preaching truth and there's going to be persecution. Amen. 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 People don't want the light. They don't want the light of the truth. They want to do their deeds in darkness. Amen. And they don't want that, that, that conviction. 
So that's what we see in Mark 6, 25 and 29. Then you get into the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts. And I mean, boy, I'll tell you right now, if you've read the book of Acts, you know that it's just chapter after chapter after chapter of persecution against the disciples. And they're being persecuted simply because they're preaching Jesus. That's the only reason. No other reason whatsoever. They're just out preaching Jesus and, and they're, they're, they're persecuted. Now, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 12, the disciples are in prison. They're thrown in prison for preaching the truth, for preaching Jesus. They're interrogated. They're beaten. Stoned. Threat. Don't you go out preaching in that name no more. Don't you go out there and preach Jesus anymore. If you do, we'll, we'll, we'll kill you. We'll throw you in prison or whatever. They're threatened. You know what they did? They went out and preached Jesus. They throw them in prison. Next day, the guards come in and said, I don't know what happened, but they're not there. They're down there at the street corner preaching Jesus. Amen. They're threatened. They're killed by the sword. We know that Herod cut the head off of James and he had Peter in prison going to do the same thing to him. God didn't allow that to happen. Amen. Amen. So we see the persecution against the disciples and it's all because they preached Jesus. Revelation chapter 1. Go ahead and turn over there. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 9. Revelation 1 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, John, John was on the isle of Patmos. He wasn't on vacation. Amen. He had been exiled. This, this, this island was was a place where they put prisoners. This is where they put people that, that had broken the law. And they murdered or, or whatever. That's what that's, they exiled him to, to the Isle of Patmos. And they did it, according to John, because he was preaching the Word of God and he was giving testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why they put him out there. Isn't that amazing? Brother says, I'm going to tell you something. You've heard the old saying, history repeats itself. I think we're headed that way. I shared with you the other week about that, that mayor out there in Houston that wanted all the preacher's notes and emails and all that, anything that they had preached about homosexuality, they wanted it. If they didn't turn it in, she would, have, she would issue a warrant for their arrest put them in jail. That's where we're headed. I've told Brother Steve several times, and I'll I, I tell you, it's a prayer of mine, regular prayer of mine. God prepare me for that day. Because I don't want to compromise the Word of God to stay out of prison. Right. Amen. And that shouldn't be just for a preacher. Yeah. That would be for any child of God. Yeah. Amen. So we see that he was exiled from preaching the Word of God and testifying of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. We're not going to read that. You're probably familiar with that where Paul begins to tell us all the things that he suffered for Christ. Right? And the Apostle Paul was whipped. He was beaten with rods. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was stoned and left for dead. Oh, because he preached Jesus. And finally, he was executed for fighting the good fight of faith. That's all. He, he was executed simply for preaching Jesus. He was executed because he said that faith in Jesus Christ was all you needed to be right with God. You didn't need to keep the law. You didn't need to observe. You didn't need to do this. You didn't need to do that. You simply trusted in Christ and His work upon the cross. Amen. And they, they killed Him. That was, that was His crime. Amen? So, we, we see that persecution against Christ and His followers has not died down. In fact, it's, it goes on in the world today. Amen. And it has gone on in, our, in, in the history of this world. Down there, the persecution of Christians in history, in the 17th century, Japan made Christianity illegal. Illegal. It was illegal. 
illegal to say you were a Christian. In the 18th century, China made Christianity illegal. Now this next one is amazing. Estimates of Christian deaths during the Ottoman Empire run as high as 50 million. I think say 50 million. Come on, preacher, you start to sound like Joe Biden. <laughs> 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 about Avery. <laughs> 50 million. But this persecution by the Ottoman Empire, now the Ottoman Empire, it was diversified and it, 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 it sprang up here and sprang up there and things like that. But it, it went on for six centuries, 600 years. They persecuted Christians and it is estimated as high as 50 million Christians were slaughtered because of their faith. Isn't that amazing? Here's the thing that's funny. Jesus Christ said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? You kill off 50 million Christians and the church just keeps on going. Hallelujah. Amen? 1917, Russia made Christianity illegal. They made Christianity illegal. And they began to confiscate the churches. And they began to tear down crosses and Millions of people were executed when they made Christianity illegal in Russia. Persecution of Christians in today's world. Now this is up here where we live at. In one month, everybody say one month. <laughs> one month in 2018, just two years ago, these are the headlines that were in the news. At least seven killed in attack on Christians in Egypt. Seven killed. What had happened was this group of Christians, they were going out and they were celebrating the, the people being saved, born again, and they went out and had a baptism. And there was a couple busloads of them, and as they were coming back, they were attacked by armed gunmen, and they just unloaded on the buses. There was 40-some people wounded severely. There was seven people killed. It was, it, was a, it was just a massacre on the roadside, and the only thing they, the only reason they did it is because it was Christians celebrating the new birth of some other believers. Handful of rotten corn a day to 50,000 Christians in North Korean prison camps. 50,000 Christians in North Korean prison camps, and all they get to eat is a handful of rotten corn. Brothers and sisters, we're fat and happy around here. Uh, Amen. We eat good. I wonder if our faith would endure that. You know what they're doing? They're saying, hey, you know, they're doing just kind of about like what they did to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say, hey, here you go, guys. Here's the, here's the fine food if you'll just turn into a Babylonian. Huh? They're saying, hey, you want something besides rotten corn to eat? All you got to do is deny your faith in Christ. <laughs> I say something about fasting. People go into conviction. Fasting. Christians in Iran sentenced to 80 lashes. I'd like to have 80 lashes. You know what their crime was? They celebrated communion. They sent us from the 80 lashes. China shutters churches and tears down crosses. They closed up, boarded up the churches. Any crosses that were on display, they tore them down and they burned them. That's just in one month, folks. The persecution. Now let me give you this. The, the next five are not headlines, they're statistics. On average, every month, Get that? On average, every month, 255 Christians are killed. In somewhere in the world, every month, 255 Christians are killed. You know what that is? That's over 3,000 in a year that are killed because of their faith. 104 Christians are abducted, taken against their will, kidnapped. Every month, 180, on average, 180 Christian women are raped, sexually harassed, and forced into marriage. 
But we talked about the, the Islamists, the extremists, the radical Islamists. Over in these other countries, like in Africa and places like that, they'll take Christian girls, young girls, 12, 13, 14 years old, they'll abduct them, they'll take them, they'll rape them, and then they'll force them to marry a, a, a radical Islamist man, and the rest of their days, they're, they're, they're trying to force them to deny their faith in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? And that's 180 every month is the average. 66 churches are attacked every month. 160 Christians detained without trial and in prison. They don't give you a trial, they just arrest you, say you're guilty and throw you in prison. Almost 2,000 a year. That's today. That's not back in the Old Testament. That's not in the New Testament with, with Jesus and Paul and Peter and all that. That's today. That's the world we live in today. That's the kind of thing that goes on. We, we're sheltered here. We don't realize that just a few thousand miles from here, people are dying for their faith. They're star being starved to death for their faith. And you know what? We don't think it would ever happen here. Amen. Go over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You there? Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse, uh, let's start reading with verse 10. Blessed. How many of you want to be blessed? Huh? Oh yeah, we want to be blessed. Well, here we go. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, Jesus says, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now how about that? Hear what the Word of God tells us? That we're blessed when we're persecuted for righteousness sake. Now brother, since I read that, I can't help but to think about the fact that we're not persecuted. Wonder why? Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, if you're persecuted, it'll be for righteousness sake. Amen. Amen. That tells us what kind of spiritual state the church is in in the United States. You know what we bought into? We bought into this acceptance and tolerance. Amen. That's what we bought into. We bought into compromise. I'm, I'm talking about the church as a whole in the United States. That's where we're at. Right. Amen. How is it that we flee persecution and go to great lengths to avoid being accused and spoken against, and yet we expect the blessings of those persecuted and accused? Amen. Man, we'll flee. We'll run. We'll, we'll, we'll turn and go the other way to avoid persecution. We'll keep silent. When somebody needs to hear the truth, we'll keep silent so that they will not speak against us. We're all guilty of it, I know. Amen? Well, sisters, I'm going to tell you something right now. When we stand at that judgment seat that I preached about last week, as Christians, if we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to either receive reward or suffer loss. We're going to suffer loss because we did everything we could to avoid persecution. There's crowds for, pers for uh, being persecuted. There's reward for being persecuted. Amen. Amen. This is good preaching, isn't it? Amen. What we need to understand are the side effects, or in parentheses, the benefits of Christian persecution. There are benefits to being persecuted. Amen? Go over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I, I, I'm sorry for those out in the car that might not have the study sheets to go along with it. We'll have to start sending somebody out in the parking lot and pass the those out. Keep up out there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. 
and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. You know what Paul is saying here to us? He's saying, listen, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, it is evident that your adversaries are the ones that are going to be ruined and condemned. What it shows for you as Christians, if we're persecuted, it shows that we are saved. Amen. Amen. That's what he says right there in verse 29. He says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him. Believe on Him for what? Believe on Him for salvation. Praise God. You know what we have in Christ? We have salvation. We have eternal life. But we also have the opportunity to suffer for Him. Amen. 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 Say, preacher, you're going crazy. You're up there getting excited about being persecuted. Hey, I want to tell you something. I want to live so godly that I am persecuted in this old sinful world. Amen. That's what we have in Christ. We have eternal life and we have the opportunity to suffer for Him. You say, I just don't like that, that kind of preaching about having the opportunity to suffer for Him. Hey, let me tell you what the disciples did. They, they were beat. And they told him, said, listen, you cannot do this anymore. You can't preach like this anymore. We're going we're, we're to beat you. And you know what? After they got beat, they sent them out. And you know what they went out? The Bible says they went out rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer for Him. Amen. The benefits of Christian persecution. Suffering promotes character. Suffering promotes character. I'm talking about the character of Christ. Amen? Amen? Suffering promotes character. Over there in Romans chapter 5, it talks about uh, patience and, and experience. And, and that word experience is, patience is enduring. Enduring what? Enduring persecution. And you, you add to your patience experience. And that what happens is as you endure persecution, that word experience speaks of character. It develops the character of Christ in us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that for the joy that was set before Him, Amen. He endured the cross, despising the shame. As we endure persecution, as we stand for truth, and as we stand for light, and we do what is right and, and holy in, in this old sinful world, and we are persecuted, it develops in us the character of Christ in a way that nothing else can. Right. Nothing else can develop that kind of character in us other than being persecuted for righteousness sake. Amen? Amen. Right. So, that's one, of the, that's one of the benefits is suffering promotes character. Suffering also provokes courage. It provokes courage. Go back over to Philippians chapter 1. You may already be there. Are you there? Philippians chapter 1. Look at verses uh, 20 and 21. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Paul says this now, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Brothers and sisters, I tell you right now, I don't know too many Christians like that. And I don't know that you're looking at one. I want to be. I want to be able to live as Christ and to know that to die for Him is gain. Amen. Amen. We love this life too much, don't we? Mm -hmm. Amen. Paul says, for me to live is Jesus. For me to live, I get an opportunity to preach Christ. I get an opportunity to witness for Jesus. I get an opportunity to testify for Christ. And if they kill me, <laughs> I ain't lost a thing. It's gain. Amen. Amen. That's courage. That's courage that is developed by enduring persecution. You might go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 sometime tonight and read what Paul went through and you'll realize just how courageous a man that Paul was. I mean, you, you think about it. Beat with wind, beat with rod, stone. I mean, sooner or later you'd think, man, give up. Right? Not Paul. 
Paul said, I'm going on for Jesus. I'm going to fight the good fight. I'm going to finish the course. I'm going to keep the thing. It develops character. It develops <clears throat> courage. Suffering promotes or proves godliness. Suffering proves godliness. John R. Rice said this, the world never burned a casual Christian at the stake. <laughs> amen. The world's got no problem with casual Christians. Say amen. amen. The world never burned a casual Christian at the stake. A. David Tozer said that to be right with God usually means that we're in trouble with man. Amen. amen. I heard a guy say one time that He's talking about it. He didn't want no preacher standing over his casket talking about how good a guy he was and that he was always a friend to everybody. He says, if a preacher gets up and starts doing that, I hope God gives me the strength to raise up out of that casket and say, oh, no, that ain't right. I made some people mad. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If the world is enmity to God and we're living godly, then the world ought to be enmity with us. You don't have to go out looking for it. Just live like Christ. Amen? We don't have to go out looking for trouble. We don't have to go out looking for persecution. We don't have to go out and stand on the corner and say, somebody throw a rock at me. Just go out and live as Christ. Amen? Persecution will come. Suffering produces joy. Suffering produces joy. That, that scripture that we just talked about there, Acts chapter 16, that's where they were rejoicing. No, I'll take that back. That's where Paul and Silas were in prison. That's where, hey, Paul and Silas had already been beat and thrown in prison. And you know the account, right? At the midnight hour, what did they do? Sing praises to God. Amen. They were rejoicing and singing praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. Guess who else heard them? God. There was an earthquake and the prison doors burst open. Amen. Let me tell you something. They were rejoicing that they were being counted worthy to suffer for Christ. They, they weren't down and out and and, and discouraged. Man, they were praising God. And God went to work. And not only were they set free, the old mean jailer got saved and his house. Amen. 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 I'm going to tell you right now, if people would see a more boldness and more joy in the face of persecution, there's not a stronger testimony than for a Christian to joyfully testify of, of the goodness of Christ in the midst of being persecuted. Right. Amen? Some kind of tribulation happens, some kind of persecution comes their way, and they say, you know what? God sure is good. Amen. That's a strong testimony. <laughs> you hear it every now and then on the news if they don't cut them off. Amen? Suffering produces joy. Suffering provides rewards. Well, I want you to look at this now. Go over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 to the right where that is out there in Philippians. Hebrews chapter 11. Suffering produces rewards. There. Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verses 24 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to what? Suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Listen to this now. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You know what that's saying right there? It's saying that Moses had, a, had an understanding of what comes through suffering for Christ. He had, he had an expectation of the recompense of the reward that means that he looked away from everything that Egypt offered him and understood that there was a greater reward awaiting him. Amen. Amen. Amen? Now you think about what Egypt offered Moses at that time. I mean, Egypt was it, buddy. Egypt was the America of the Old Testament. I can tell you that right now. They had health, wealth, and prosperity, buddy. They had gold, and they had silver, and they had fine clothes, and they had all the food you could want to eat. They had it all. And it was laid right in Moses' lap. But you know what? He said, mm -mm -mm. there's a better reward, a reward waiting for me. I'd rather suffer with the people of God than enjoy that for a little while. Because 
because I know there's an eternal reward waiting for me. Brothers and sisters, when we run for persecution, when we run, when we compromise so that we will not be spoken against, I can tell you right now, we're, we're, we're passing up a great reward, eternal reward in glory. Amen. We don't think about that. We think about just having a little bit of peace here. Having a little more peace on our job. Having a little more peace in our family. Well, I tell you right now, that's, that's fleeting peace. That's not going to last. Right. We need to realize that there's a greater reward. Amen? Amen? There's a greater peace. A greater rest that we can have. Suffering produces joy. Suffering provides rewards. All these things are the benefits of being persecuted. Living for Christ and being persecuted. So, the last thing we're going to look at is preparing for that moment of persecution. If we believe the Bible, how many? Amen. You believe the Word of God? Amen. If we believe the Bible, then we know that perilous times are coming. If we believe the Bible, we know that if we live godly, we shall suffer persecution. Amen? Let me tell you something. The ungodlier the world gets, the more persecution is going to come against the godly. Amen? So we know it's coming. And we have to prepare now. That's why I pray, God, help me to be strong if they ever arrest me and put me in jail. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. I think it could have happened down the road. If I live, the Lord tarries. And I want to be ready for it. Amen. And we need to prepare for that kind of persecution. Amen? Amen? So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we've got to determine to stand for the truth. Amen. You've got to get that determination about you now. Amen. Young people, let me tell you something. You've got to get that about you now. I'm a whole lot more determined now than I was at 29 when I first got saved. Amen. You don't have that long. I've been doing this for 32 years. Building this determination and praying and reading and studying and having the Word of God in my heart. You don't have that long. This world's going sour in a hurry. You better get that determination about you. I, Glenn, I don't guess I'll ever forget what you said about that youth pastor coming to y'all's church when you were young. And that youth pastor told him, said, listen, one of these days somebody's going to put a cigarette in front of you. One of these days somebody's going to put a beer in front of you. One of these days somebody's going to put something in front of you and want you to try it or do it. And you know it's wrong. And you cannot wait till then to make that stand. you got to start preparing yourself for it now when you're young. Right. Hey. Well, it's the same way with persecution. It's coming. Right. We better start preparing now. And we've got to be determined that we're going to stand for the truth. You know what that means? That means that there will be a willingness to be labeled stupid. I'm sorry if, if Steely hears that up there in the, in the truck. I'm sorry, Steely. She's got on me twice for saying that word in, in preaching. But... But it means, if you're determined to stand for the truth, it means that there is a willingness to be labeled stupid for believing in creation. Right. People look at you like you are an idiot if you tell them that you believe God spoke the world into, create, into, into existence in six days. You're right. What? They'll say, oh, so you think that a day is worth a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, so it could have been six thousand years instead of six days. No, I believe it was literally six days. God, God could have done it quicker if he wanted to, but I believe he did it in six days. People say, you are foolish. Amen. Foolish. I got people in my own family. They got fooled because I believe that God spoke, said, let there be light that was light. Amen. It means a willingness to be uh, labeled homophobic for rejecting homosexuality. Amen? You're homophobic. You just you hate homosexuals. No, I don't hate them. I, I, I love their soul. I want them to be saved. I don't want them to spend eternity in hell. That's just like I, I told somebody the other day. This guy that's been breaking in the church. I don't want him to go to hell. I wouldn't mind him going to jail for a few years or days or something. But I don't want him to go to hell. And I don't want a homosexual to go to hell because that's where that lifestyle is going to lead them. Amen. Right. 
Are you homophobic? That's what you are. See, that's, that's the kind of, you better be determined to stand on the truth. Right. You better know the truth to be determined to stand on it. Right. It means that you would have a willingness to be labeled anti-feminist for rejecting abortion. Yep. Well, it's her body. She ought to have a choice. Yeah. Those kind of arguments you're going to face. You hate women because you, you don't give them that choice. Right? Amen. Some of you, hey, wait, some of you. Amen. Some of you may be sitting out there saying, well, you're wrong, preacher. No, I'm not wrong. And the reason I say I'm not wrong is because I'm talking about it from the Word of God. Amen. It's important that a man wants to die. We don't set that appointment. I ain't, I ain't put it in my calendar. To, hey, I'm going to die on this day. That's up to God. He's the one that gives life. He's the one that creates life. He told, he told Jeremiah, that even before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. God forms in the womb. God makes that life. God takes that life. It's up to Him when that life comes. It's up to Him when that life goes. Amen. Nobody has a choice in that. Amen. Being determined to stand for the truth means that you be willing to be labeled intolerant. Intolerant for professing the exclusivity of Christ. In other words, Jesus is the only way to be saved. He's the only one. I don't care what Joel Olstein says. He, Jesus is the only way. Amen. If you believe in Muhammad, you're going to die and go to hell. If you believe in Buddha, you're going to die and go to hell. If you believe in anything else other than Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. Amen. I'm sorry. Amen. But you ought to be so thankful that God made a way. Yes, sir. It didn't cost you nothing. Right. It cost him everything. Amen. Yes, so you got to be determined. Stand on the truth. And listen, you can't stand on it if you don't know it. you got to know it and you got to be determined to stand on it. We can prepare for persecution by drawing support from one another. Drawing support from one another. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. You're right there at it, aren't you? Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 24 25. Let us consider one another. You ever consider your brothers and sisters that you go to church with? You ever consider them to provoke them to love and to good works? Hey, you know what? It ought to bother you if you have a person that you go to church with that's not involved in some type of service for the Lord. Right. Right. It ought to bother you to the point that you provoke them to serve God. Amen. How about that? Forsake not the assembling yourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another all the more as you see that day approaching. We, hey, you want to prepare for the persecution to come? You better be faithful in the house of God. Right. Amen. 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 Look, when I, when I preach about inviting people to church and witnessing and, and things like that, I know preachers, I, I know sometimes we I, you get a bunch of preachers together and it's, it ain't five minutes till somebody says, so how many of y'all running down there at Hope Baptist Church? How many of y'all got attending down there at Hope Baptist Church? But when I'm preaching and telling you to be faithful in the house of God and invite your family and friends to come, it's not so I can tell the preachers down the road that we've got this many at Hope Baptist Church. It's so that you can be prepared for the work of the ministry so that you will be ready for that persecution when it comes. Well, I tell you to serve God. The reason I'm telling you to serve God is because I believe Jesus is coming and I want every one of you doing what He wants you to do when He comes. Amen. 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 Serve God. If He came tomorrow, have you done what you're supposed to be doing for Him? That's why I preach that. Amen. 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 I'll move on. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Finally, to prepare for persecution, we have to develop our security from the Lord. Develop our security from the Lord. If your security rests in your good works, what are you going to do when they throw you in prison? 
and you can't work. If your security rests and you come to the church, what are you going to do when they lock the doors of the church? Our security has to be only in Christ. Go to Philippians once again. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We'll, we'll wrap it up. Philippians 3. Let me know when you're there. Verse 20. For our conversation, that conversation that means our life, our life is in heaven. You, you know we're citizens there already, right? Through Christ. Yeah. All right. We've been made to sit together in heavenly places. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I always like to think about that. I like to think about when John saw them 24 elders sitting around the throne of God. He saw me there. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. We've been made to sit together in heaven. Hey, listen. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. My security is in Jesus Christ. People say, you believe in that old eternal security? I sure do. You know why? Because i got an eternal Savior. Right. Hallelujah. My, etern my, my security rests in Jesus. And he has eternal life. He's never going to die. Right. Therefore, I am saved in him. I'm secure. Right. Amen. Right. Brother sisters, you better know that. You better know that. There's a lot of folks sitting in Baptist churches today that believe their, their salvation depends on something they're doing. Say amen. amen. You better make sure that your security rests in Christ and Him alone. Amen? There's no better way to expound on this than to give you the words of John Chrysostom. He was arrested for preaching against the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church and their abuse of the poor. Now get this, as he was brought to trial, they threatened to banish him. You cannot banish me, he said. For this world is my Father's house. <laughs> then we will kill you how the authorities. No, you cannot. For my life is hid with Christ in God. Then we'll strip you of all your earthly possessions and your treasures. No, you cannot. For my possessions and treasures are in heaven and that's where my heart is also. You'll be driven away from your family and friends, screamed the members of the high court. No, you cannot. For I have a friend in heaven whom you cannot separate me from. There is nothing you can do to harm me. Amen. Hallelujah. That's where we need to be, folks. We've got to be ready for the persecution, for it is coming. Hey, that's the way we need to be praying. God, prepare us so that we might glorify you and rejoice in the fact that you have counted us worthy to suffer here. Amen? Amen. Stand with me, heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You know, God's been working over the last few weeks in some of this old shelter. Young man standing back there tonight got saved this last Wednesday, wasn't it? Okay, last Wednesday. Man got saved Sunday morning. God's a Now, it might not be salvation for you tonight, but God might be speaking to you right now that you're not ready for that moment of persecution. you haven't described your faith right now, you'd have to say it's weak. It's not strong. You know what? This altar's open. We're going to close in prayer, but if you'd just like to come and pray this altar tonight and say, Lord, help me. I know persecution's coming. I know if I live godly for you that I'm going to suffer. And I want to be ready for you. I want to be ready to glorify you through that time of suffering. I'd like to come to God. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow our hearts before the throne of grace tonight. We understand and confess tonight that there is nothing hid from you. You 
know us inside out. You know the depths of our heart and all they contain. You know the fear. You know the anxiousness. Father, you know the Compromise. You know the worldliness that's in our hearts. You know tonight those that are ready to stand and those who are not. So God, search us, search us tonight. Search our hearts tonight, God. And Father, I pray for that old time conviction to become on, come on every one of us. Yeah. God, we need to be convicted about our life, our conversation, as Paul said. How we're living in this ungodly world. How we're living in this time of, of, of peril, this time of darkness. Are we tolerant of things that go against your word? Are we accepting things that are ungodly? Are we just kind of turning our heads so that we will not have to be confronted? Father, there's people out there that's lost and dying and going to hell. They need somebody to speak the truth to them. And you've given us that command to go and preach the gospel to every creature. To go and be living witnesses for you. So God help us tonight. I pray that this message sticks in our heart. I pray that we will begin to prepare ourselves to live godly and suffer persecution. And do it all for your glory and for your praise. Help us to be a strong church, Lord. Help us to be strong Christians. Help us to be ready when you come. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.